All right, diving in today, and uh, we're focusing in on something that should pique the interest of all you medical microbiologists out Pleasantly. there. Pleasantly. Should uh, be right up your alley. Yeah. Aries Suppoloid. We've got, uh, well, a few good sources to pull from MicroPwiki and uh, the CDC, of course, all right, all right. and Microbe Candis. Um, yeah, good stuff. Should give us should give us a really good overview of Aries Suppoloid. Now, I know it might not be the most like commonly known infection. Why not household name? No, no, not at all. But it can actually get pretty serious, right? Oh, no, absolutely. And and for folks in the lab, especially anyone working with, well, animal samples, it's one you really got to be aware of. Totally. So let's break it down then. Like Aries Suppoloid, what, what is it really? So at its core, it's a bacterial infection, right? Caused by... No surprise here, Erysipelotrix rhizopathiae, bit of a mouthful. A little bit, but yeah. it's a good one. Rolls right off the tongue, you know, once you get it. Once you get it, yeah. Erysipelotrix rhizopathiae. There you go. So, um, where does this where does this little bug where does it hang out? What kind of environments? Well, it's it's actually pretty ubiquitous. You can find it in all sorts of places: soil, water, mm -hmm. even on on plants. But yeah, so not not too picky. Not too picky at all. It gets around, but. It's real, it's real home, it's comfort zone, I guess you could say, is in animals. Especially pigs, right? Pigs, yeah. yeah. And, the, and they're like the, the prime reservoir for Erysipelothrix rhizopathiae. That's right. So anyone working with pigs, you know, farmers, vets, butchers, even us lab folks handling those samples, we're all we're all kind of in the in the danger zone. Definitely occupational hazard. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, it's a zoonotic disease, right? Wow. So jumps from the animals to us. Exactly. Usually through uh well cuts and abrasions on the skin you get a little nick you're handling some some infected tissue boom there you go yeah not good so let's say like our listener our microbiologist mm -hmm. is in the lab they're working with let's say pig tissue they get a little little nick from a scalpel something like that what are they going to see like how does this how does this thing actually present all right so Erysipeloid, it can actually show up in a few different ways. Uh, the the most common one you see is what we call localized cutaneous erysipeloid. Okay, cutaneous meaning skin, obviously. Uh, but yeah. what is it? What does it actually look like? What are microbiologists going to notice? So picture this: you got a patch of skin, usually on the fingers, kind of a reddish, purplish color. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's swollen, and it's it's distinctly painful. Now here's the thing, and this is a key difference from other skin infections. Okay, yeah, talk. You typically won't see any pus. Right, right. No pus. And that's a big one, isn't it? Right. That helps differentiate it from, from some of the other uh, skin infections out there, like like erysipelas, for example. Right, exactly. Erysipelas, you know, caused by strep or staph, you're going to see that pus. But with erysipeloid, nope, no pus. That's one of the hallmarks. That's that's a good one to remember. And I think this this localized form, sometimes it's called uh, erysipeloid of Rosenbach, right? Mark got it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Named after... Uh, Dr. Ferdinand Rosenbach, he's the one who really kind of laid out all the the key features way back when. Back in the day, huh? So we're talking like... Late 1800s. Late 1800s, okay. So yeah, it's been around. Been around for a while, yeah. So we've got the, the localized kind, the erysipelate <laughs> of Rosenbach. Right. The milder form. Right. But it's not always so mild and localized, is it? Unfortunately not. It can also spread you know, become what we call diff diffuse cutaneous erysipeloid. Okay, and so what, what happens there? Like, how does that look different? Well, in the diffuse form, you're going to see the infection kind of spreading out to other areas of the skin. So instead of just that one, you know, localized patch, you might see multiple purplish spots or plaques. Hmm. Okay, so it's starting to get a little little more serious. Yeah. And then you've got the, the, real, the real heavy hitter, generalized erysipeloid. And that's where that's where things get really, really bad. Exactly. Like, that's when the infection, it actually gets into the bloodstream. Oh, no. Yeah. So we're talking like... We're talking systemic complications now. Fever chills, all that. Yep. Fever chills, joint pain. You can even get endocarditis. Endocarditis. So the lining of the heart gets inflamed. Exactly. Wow. So it can go from, from this seemingly a minor skin thing to to a really life-threatening condition absolutely that's why that's why early diagnosis and treatment they're they're just absolutely crucial yeah you don't want to mess around with this but i imagine it can be tricky sometimes right to to catch it early it can be it can be because erysipeloid in humans it's it's actually relatively rare right so it can get misdiagnosed treatment can get delayed so our microbiologist listener they got to be really really on top of things Absolutely, especially especially given their their line of work. 
Right. So let's say they, they suspect erysipeloid. What's what's the go-to treatment? What are we looking at? Well, good news is erysipelothrix rhizopathia, it usually responds well to penicillin. Penicillin. Good old penicillin. The classic. So typically a course of uh, five to seven days, either oral penicillin or uh, intramuscular procaine benzyl penicillin. Procaine benzyl penicillin. That's a good one. Yeah. But of course, penicillin, it's not for everybody, is it? Uh, Allergies and all that. Right. Exactly. You got to watch out for that. Yeah. So for those folks who can't tolerate penicillin, you've got uh, erythromycin or doxycycline as alternatives. Good backups. Yeah. Good to have those options. But there's a there's a big one here, right? Something really, really important for our, our microbiologist listeners to know. Absolutely. This is key. Erysipelethrix rhizopathia, it's, it's intrinsically resistant to vancomycin. Vancomycin, no go. Nope, won't touch it. Not going to work. So if you're thinking vanco, think again. Yeah. Not going to, not going to do anything. And, uh, for that, for that generalized form, that really serious one. Right. What's the what's the go to there? For generalized, you're looking at benzathine, benzyl penicillin. Benzyl benzyl penicillin. That's the that, one. That's the one. And okay, now let's say hypothetically, someone's they're infected but they don't get treatment. What what happens? Does it just does it just go away on its own? Well, some cases of erysipelate they might actually resolve spontaneously. Really? Yeah. Even without treatment. Even without treatment, it can take a while though. We're talking weeks, months, even. Oh wow. Okay, so it's not it's not like a, you know, a quick quick fix. It's gonna linger. Yeah, it's gonna linger, and and there's always that risk of those complications. The complication, yeah. We don't we don't want those. So treatment is treatment is definitely the way to go. Treatment is is always preferred. It's just it's not worth the risk to let it run its course. And and this is where, you know, the role of the microbiologist, it becomes so important. You're not just, you know, identifying the bug. You're you're really helping to guide those treatment decisions. Absolutely. It's it's all about collaboration, working together to get the best outcome for the patient. Exactly. So we've covered a lot of ground today, talked about the different ways erysipeloid can present, the challenges of diagnosing it, and and really the importance of of getting that treatment right. Yeah. But as we wrap up here. I want, to, I want to leave our listeners with a with a bit of a thought, something to ponder. Oh, okay, I like it. Shoot. So we talk about antibiotic resistance, right? Yeah. Big issue. And erysipelothrix rhizopathiae. Yeah. Intrinsically resistant to vancomycin. Right. Big one. So what happens, you know, if if penicillin or, or those other options, what if they're not viable? What are our other strategies? What else is out there? What's on the horizon? That's a good question. A really good question. Something to think about. Something to to keep in mind as you as you go about your work. Definitely something to keep an eye on. Absolutely. And hey, if you find any answers, let us know.